Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joe Horsecapture, Vice President of Native Collections and Amundsen Curator at the Autry Museum of the American West. <clears throat> First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of this land, the Gabrielino Tongva people. I'd also like to thank the Autry's generous donors and members for making this program possible. I am honored along with the Board of Trustees to welcome you to the Artist Salons. Today joining me is Lakota artist Diani Whitehawk, whose painting and sculptural works reflect cross-cultural experience through a combination of influences from modern abstract painting to traditional Lakota art form. The Autry recently added a suite of Diani's prints to its collection, which we will discuss later. If you have questions during our conversation, please enter them in the Q&A, which stands for question and answer, Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. The Autry Museum of the West represents something slightly different to each of you who visits us physically and virtually. For me, the Native American collections is one of the great defining strengths of our institution. Diani Whitehawk is a curator and artist and graduate of Haskell Indian Nations University, where she obtained her BFA and received her MFA in studio arts from University of Wisconsin, Madison. Her formal artistic education combined with her Lakota upbringing and the study of the work created by her people makes for a unique combination in the native art world. She has received numerous awards, including the McKnight Visual Artist Fellowship, Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant, and a Native Arts and Culture Foundational Regional Fellowship Grant. Whew, just to name a few. Her works can be found in the collections of the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, National Museum of the American Indian, Smithsonian, the Tweed Museum of Art, and now the Autry, and now the Autry Museum of the West, to name a few. Diani, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me, Joe, it's, and for the kind intro. Absolutely. It's so, <laughs> so good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, I'm going to give you one correction. Okay. Um, I got my associate's degree from Haskell Indian Nations University, my AA, and then I got my BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts, and then on to my MFA at UW-Madison. Okay. And All leave right. IAIA IA out of the mix. All right. Sorry. No, no disrespect to <laughs> IAIA by any means. So, so just if you don't mind, so just as a point of reference for our audience um, who are in the LA region for the most part, some may be in Santa Fe, you are in Shakopee, Minnesota, which is about mm -hmm. 30 minutes south of the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. And just in the fear to, spirit of full disclosure, it is 63 degrees here. It is three and degrees here. It is three degrees there. Okay. Three. Well, <laughs> yeah. thank you with that. With thank you that uh, all of the with it with it with the cold air that luckily all the technology is working. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. All right. So let's. I'm just gonna before we jump into talking about your artwork, we're just gonna. I like to jump in with something sort of very straightforward. That's gonna help our help. Uh, hopefully, our audience understand. So it's about tribal organization. So okay. Lakota, which mm -hmm. is in the past <clears throat> improperly referred to as Sioux, mm -hmm. is part of a larger group as we have Lakota, mm -hmm. Dakota, and Nakota. Is mm -hmm. it, can you sort of just explain that in briefly? Is that possible? Sure, so the, the um, greater organization of our people is the Ocheti Shakoni. And that refers to all of the um, seven council fires, which includes all the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota um, <clears throat> bands of the Ocheti Shakoin. And Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota simply uh, refers to the language dialects and <clears throat> and the area, um, the areas through which our folks lived, because we. Um, historically and contemporarily uh, cover a lot of ground, you know, from the States all the way up into Canada, um, East into, you know, uh, Western Plains, you know, all the way over. I'm in Minnesota right now. So I'm in Minnesota, which is Dakota homelands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, my 
reservation is in South Central South Dakota and then Oglala, you know, Pine Ridge is beyond that. And, you know, so, I mean, our folks um, migrated over all, and uh, stayed over, you know, vast range of, of area. And so there are different dialects in different regions and then different bands. Um, so Oglala Lakota is a band in Sichangu Lakota is a band in Sisitwan uh, Dakota is a band. You know, so there's different um, categorizations within the larger of Cheti Shakoi. Right. So nice. I'm Sichangu Lakota, so Rosebud Sioux is the, the tribe. Right. But yeah, Sioux is a, is a misnomer. It's not our name for ourselves. Right, exactly. And as you know, you know, my tribe, which we say is Aadnene, which means people, the white clay. Historically, we were often called Grovan, which means big belly. Mm. And, you know, that's inaccurate. Although, as I am in my mid 50s, I'm certainly starting to become big belly, so to speak, in a literal <laughs> sense. But, but our tribe is, is often referred to as white clay. Yeah. Yeah. Sue, so, um, I, I might not get this right, but I think it's, it was a mix of um, French and Ojibwe references to our folks, and it's something to do with snakes, yeah. <laughs> which I try not to <laughs> emulate. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Lakota is uh, ally or friend. It's, mm. That's you know how we refer to ourselves. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, quite the opposite of what Sue is meant to be. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, so if you don't mind, we're just going to jump straight into your artwork Let's and discuss it. it. Okay, so <clears throat> Diani's work, well, first, I've known Diani for a very long time, and we've been friends for, geez, I don't even know how long. And so for me, both personally and professionally, not only I value Diani's friendship, um, but I also have been a great admirer of her work and also being able to see her work change and uh, for lack of a better way of putting develop over the years. And I'm just a huge, huge fan. And Diani, a, lo a, lot, a lot of your work, and this is, a, this is a painting, a lot of your work, as I mentioned in, in the intro, in a way is sort of like abstract modern art and combining traditional Lakota art, mm -hmm. but you're using the form of Western painting. You know what I mean? And, well, of course, you know what I mean. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. sometimes. And yeah. you sort of lay these two on top of each other, which is just, it, which is, it's really powerful. So if you can maybe, and we're going to show some of these, if you can maybe say something or maybe walk us through some of these works and sure. kind of what you're, yeah. what you're feeling here. So um, this piece, and it's a, this is a good piece to start that conversation too. Um, this piece is titled Been Seeing You for a While Now. Uh, and I did it as, was part of my MFA exhibition. So this piece is, was done in 2011. And my work combines um, the histories, aesthetics, and the mediums of uh, modern abstraction in the form of easel painting and also the histories, mediums, and aesthetics of Lakota abstraction. And that, you know, is very much representative of kind of the amalgamation of my life experiences. Um, you know, I grew up in the city, but I grew up predominantly raised within uh, the native community within the city. And then I, back and forth to the reservation to visit family and go back for powwow and ceremony and just visits. and. Um, you know, spent eight years in tribal college systems and spent, um, you know, uh, three years after that back in mainstream academia. And, you know, so I have all of these cross-cultural life experiences that kind of are not kind of, but are represented in the amalgamation of, of, of how I pull from those life references and those life experiences and those different forms of education. Um, and, and that comes out through my art quite naturally. So this piece, been seeing you for a while now, kind of represents this moment of when I was in grad school, I had just come out of these years of um, being in tribal colleges that focus on teaching from an indigenous perspective and mm -hmm. really focus on the history of, of native art. 
Uh, and then I go it back into mainstream academia and I had to kind of play catch up and um, get my head on straight in regards to uh, Western art movements and, and study from that perspective. <clears throat> but when I was studying um, modern abstract painters, who, you know, I, I, I love painting, I love easel painting, I love abstraction, I love all of that. And I, and I also love, um, you know, Lakota abstraction and indigenous art forms and, and all of that. And so I'm studying the modern art <clears throat> and, but every time I see it, I'm seeing it through my perspective. So I'm looking at their work and I can only help but see our work. And so the title, been seeing you for a while now was um, illustrative of this moment when I realized you know, in my research of these artists, as I started falling in love with certain um, abstract painters, I kept finding moments of reference where they were collecting indigenous art or just happened to live by native communities or, mm -hmm. oh, they're looking at this, they're looking at that. And I'm like, well, that's, I could see it, you know, <laughs> I could see it. And so I've, yeah, I've been seeing you for a while now. <laughs> you know, that's the, the reference to this. So these are two, they're supposed to be painted as, um, they're moccasin tops. So if you think of the uh, the top of a moccasin or the moccasin vamp, people will mm -hmm. call it, which is the part that you adorn before you attach it to the sole. That's what these forms are. Um, and so it's with this pair is supposed to be like a pair of moccasins kicked back and you're kind of looking past your own mm. feet like, oh yeah, I recognize you. Oh, that's great. And considering where we are with time, I'll be honest with you, I we have way too many slides, so. <laughs> As I started Just let me know what you want me to talk about. <laughs> yeah, as I've been putting this together, I said, oh, you got to include that one. Oh, you got to include that one. Oh, you got to go. So we need about two or three hours. What? I yeah. Maybe not today. So as we saw in the um, painting from the intro one, oftentimes mm -hmm. your theme is this cross, this mm -hmm. four directional cross. Mm -hmm. And then the inside sometimes has different decorations as well as around the perimeter. And it seems to be a constant, not a constant, but a, a theme that appears in some of your work. Yeah, it's a, definitely a reoccurring symbol in my work. Um, and it's a reoccurring symbol in uh, Lakota um, art forms and <clears throat> understandings and worldviews. And I, I think that's why I, <clears throat> excuse me, why I use it as much as I do is it's, it's, it's representative of, um, you know, look at the worldview and, and philosophies and how we see ourselves in the world and in relationship to one another and in relationship to the land and our, our place in those relationships. And, um, and so because it's such a, a, a centering, um, the symbol in it itself is embedded with, with such kind of core teachings on Lakota philosophy I can't help but continue to return to that center when I'm making. Uh, and it's it's also, you know, it's beautiful and it, it's balanced and um, it's a, a way of recognizing, you know, those teachings and recognizing um, my relationship within the world. So, I mean, this particular symbol is used, is, is, used a lot in Lakota symbolism, but this particular symbol is used a lot in a lot of different tribes and a lot of um, communities outside of the United States. I mean, this is something that's, I think that people have um, utilized to speak to uh, larger understandings in the world in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. One of the aspects of your work that is just phenomenally engaging is not only you not only sometimes, not only do you paint on the surface, but you sometimes actually bead or quill on the surface. Mm -hmm. And this is a this is a great <clears throat> example. You can see the painting around the outside, and although it's kind of a little tricky to tell um, in, in this in, in this image here as we're looking at it, you have pork, you have um, blue and red porcupine quills, as well as some beaded, um, uh, what's a, a, a white and black lines border, around the each border the yeah yeah the border thank you and it, it, it's an interesting way how you're combining this this painting which we all think of as sort of a western way of doing it but also you're you're sort of flipping that in a way on its head by by including these real 
traditional forms. Mm -hmm. um, so before I started combining all of those things, I, you know, I was practicing them, but, you know, they were kind of independent of each other, <clears throat> at least through materials, you know, conceptually, they weren't independent of each other. But so I, you know, I have a whole nother part of my, my practice and my making that doesn't, that isn't intended for galleries and museums. So, you know, I, I make moccasins and dresses and the, the regalia that, you know, me and my family dance in or that we use for ceremony. And I learned how to bead as a young teenager well before I learned how to paint in a, you know, this format. <clears throat> and I, so those practices have been a, an ongoing part of, of who I am and, and they're really important to me. And when I was in my undergrad, I was doing, you know, taking traditional arts classes and doing those things. And then I was also in the painting studio making big, large abstract paintings. And then when I got to grad school, I had to figure out how to marry all of those things. And so now I often bring, um, bring them together either <clears throat> conceptually uh, and or mimicking uh, beadwork and quill work through paint, or I'll actually, you know, bring them together through the medium. So uh, it just depends on, on, I guess, what my heart's calling for at the moment. But uh, I, I really enjoy all of them, and I kind of need them all in my life. So sometimes mm -hmm. they happen all on the same canvas. So, so normally I would ask a question at the end, but a question just came in, which I'm assuming is related to this one. So I'll ask it now. It says, is part of the canvas primed and part not, or is it all primed? Um, this one is linen. And if I remember correctly, I think I put, um, I think I put a, a medium, a clear either matte or satin medium over the top of the linen to seal it. Uh, and then that's you know what allowed me to paint the outside and then do the gold leaf on the outside and leave that raw linen there in the center uh, to do the beadwork and the porcupine quill work on. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure that's how I how I primed that surface and so that I was able to have that kind of dual effect of of being painted and left raw. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. Good question. So I visited your studio um, a number of months ago, actually about a year ago, before I left the Twin Cities to came here to wonderful Los Angeles, California. And I believe in your studio, you were working on this piece at the time. Mm. And so this is the overall <clears throat> view. And then let's see the next slide just to explore the detail. So this is not paint. These are actually bugle beads. Mm -hmm. So, in, in relation to the work that we just saw, this is, you know, a similar, but also has a very different feel to it. Yeah, so it's, we're kind of, we're in chronology, we're going to skip a chapter and then we're going to come back to that chapter later. But um, I, when, when I mentioned kind of having to figure out how to marry all of those practices and make them happen at the same time, that has happened, you know, I've explored a variety of different ways to make that happen. And part of it was I started mimicking porcupine quill work and lane stitch beadwork, which we'll share, share an example of later, uh, through paint. And then I was also, you know, stitching lane stitch beadwork onto canvas and, um, and Lane stitch beadwork is the uh, is the most utilized form or stitch or technique within the history of Lakota beadwork, and so it's 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 what I practice. And so that aesthetic of this like stacked rows of of vertical lines of beads um, is something that plays a really strong part in in my artistic practice and in my paintings. And I was visiting with my friend, Tom Jones, who's a Ho-Chunk photographer. And he and I are both bead fanatics. And I was telling him about this practice piece that I had to do and it was gonna take forever to bead. 
And um, and he just laughed at me and he goes, girl, you gotta start using bugle beads. And I was like, bugle beads? No, that's not what we do. Uh, you know, we do lane stitch, we use seed beads, you know, and-, and um, You use lane stitch, and, damn it. I'm not going to I know, and, and I kind of <laughs> laughed it off. And then later I was like, but actually those bugles are in this, like they produce this, a similar aesthetic Mm -hmm. to what I was doing through paint that mimics um, quill work and lane stitch paintwork. And so it's like, hmm, maybe I'll try it. And now yeah. I use them like crazy. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, hats off and much gratitude to my friend Tom Jones for the nudge. Uh, but it's it's been a fun thing to play with. So, so these are 30 millimeter long um, bugles and they're really hard to find. And a lot of these are... Um, they're older and um, they're tough to work with, and they're a lot of fun to work with. Yeah, and just for scale, about how wide is this? How wide is this? This piece, the the painting is forty eight by forty eight inches. Okay. So the and the the beaded section is it's sizable. You know, it, it's a it's a it's maybe about a lot of work, wide, isn't it? Isn't it about two feet wide? The uh, yeah, at least. Yeah. If not, if not more. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. And here's another, here's another great example of how you're using traditional. And of course, you know, everybody has their own issue with the word traditional. Mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, <laughs> traditional design elements with painting as well as beadwork. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to talk about it or should we keep moving? Well, we'll keep going. Um, okay. But you can see here the triangles that she made. Some of them are beaded inside of the design in the middle. And then as it sort of bleeds out outside of the gold edging, it is painted. So this is a really great, this is, if we looked at one and then looked at the other, this one really kind of brings the two together where yeah. visually it's almost seamless, but it's not seamless at the same time. One thing that I'll share about this one is so the symbolism in the background of this piece that is also occur that I utilize a lot within my work that also is is uh, Lakota symbolism, uh, and then you know the 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 foreground the symbolism that's beaded in the foreground um, that design with the um, what I've been told is a whirlwind design and then the the pieces that come up and go out like that that connect the beaded section mm -hmm. um is i i see that design over and over and over again on in collections on older lakota moccasins mm -hmm. and i've asked a number of people what this motif references specifically and i haven't gotten <clears throat> enough repeat answers to know for sure so part of me made this piece and beaded this piece because I would like to know why this is such a common reoccurring format on moccasins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> and and again, um, just for scale, but do you remember how, about how big this was? This one is um, 48 by 60. Oh, wow, okay. And nope. here- yes. <laughs> and here you that. have you have some some white elements we're going to look at shortly um some uh, and again the, the color may be off just because looking at the monitor sort of an orange tan color and then a wavy lines on the bottom next slide please and if we look at this detail we can really see how you're painting you are well, you're, you're painting a lot of stripes, my friend. Um, <laughs> giving, yep. giving that texture, whether it is dentelium or whether it is, as you mentioned, bugle beads or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, if you're talking about physically sewing on or stitching, whatever trim you want to use on the canvas, here you are painting them. Yeah. Um, and I was right, I wanted to check, it is 60 by 48, this painting. Um, mm -hmm. So the background is copper, and then, um, you yeah, know, these, you know, the, the white uh, stripes are, um, are actually uh, 
you know, they, they operate as being monochromatic, but as you can see, there are a lot of different uh, lighter colors of yellows and greens and browns and uh, pinks. And, um, and then the bottom is this wave pattern of um, colors that I actually pulled from rocks. Um, so this piece is part of the uh, series called the Quiet Strength series. And uh, this is the fourth one in the series. The three previous to it are just untitled Quiet Strength 1, 2, and 3. And this is the first one that branches off a new portion within that series that's titled She Gives Quiet Strength. Mm -hmm. um, and the Quiet Strength series pays tribute to the history and to the legacies, the phenomenal legacies that Native women uh, have contributed to the artistic history of this land base and to the history of abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, it is undervalued, underappreciated, and um, underrepresented in the way that we teach art history. And so this series is meant to push back against that and to um, pay tribute to those legacies and those artists whose names have not been recorded, whose um, contributions have not been uh, written about in our literature in the way that I believe they deserve. Yeah. Um, and it, they also pay tribute to this, the strength of women that is unique to the strength of our uh, male or masculine relatives. And um, part of you know painting these really large canvases in these really minute ways honors the intense uh, dedication to those quill work and beadwork practices. Uh, but the she gives part of the title extends that recognition beyond just our, our female or feminine human relatives and begins to recognize our common mother, uh, the land and the earth and all that she gives for us to be able to, to, to live and to sustain us. Um, and so the elements in here, the background is, is copper. It's a, it's a copper paint. And so it's meant to reference like all of these elements that she gives, that the land gives us to sustain us. Uh, and so the, you know, it's referencing porcupine quills. It's also referencing glass beads, which is a product of the earth as well. It's referencing stone, water, air. It's referencing, you know, the, the materials that come from the land such as copper. Um, and yeah, just meant to, to kind of situate and you know, be able to have conversations with people that to recognize, um, to recognize those gifts and, you know, what we as people should be doing to reciprocate that relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because not many people realize this. And oftentimes I don't even think museum curators realize this. And this is exclusively talking about just planes collections, okay? Mm -hmm. So the vast, it's been my experience, the vast majority of museum historic planes collections in museums, the vast majority of those items were made by women. Because mm -hmm. um, historically, men didn't do beadwork. Mm -hmm. Historically, men didn't make clothes. Mm -hmm. They're almost all women. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you mentioned this because that really hasn't been at least from my point of view, and clearly what you said um, uh, just a bit ago from your point of view as well, that hasn't necessarily been acknowledged in that sense? Not in the way that it needs to be. Exactly. Um, you know, the, the Hearts of Our People exhibition was a, as a you know, way to start to push back on that in a, in a large format. Um, and, but, one thing that I, I want to like really drive into that point, and I'm glad you're bringing it up, Joe, is that that when I mentioned before all of those you know white male artists that get all the attention for abstraction, mm -hmm. you know when they're looking at and referencing indigenous art, they're looking at the work of women. That's right. All Let right. Let that That's sink a... in for a minute, folks. <laughs> <laughs> And the part about this, as I'm looking at this slide, it reminds me of, because you know as well as I do, I'm a museum collection guy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it reminds me of, if you look at a detail, next slide, please. If you look at a detail of historic work, 
Mm -hmm. It has a similar feeling to what you're making. This is a, mm -hmm. a yoke, uh, yeah, I guess it'd be a yoke from a black feet dress. Unfor this is not in our collection at the Autry. This is actually at National Museum of the American Indian. Um, and I, I enjoy these kind of details because oftentimes mm -hmm. when we're looking at the whole item, we miss this kind of intimacy, this kind of mm -hmm. intimacy of the work. We can see each little bead, how she put each of these lane stitches um, uh, each of these lane stitches in her mm -hmm. careful selection of the color at the very top you can see that little tab that honors the tail of the animal and how it's painted at the very bottom you can see i forgot what those beads are called those little square looking ones you know what i'm talking about yeah it depends on who you ask i mean nowadays they probably be cube beads or but they're they're cut beads i mean they're yeah. large large cut glass beads right and it's it's these little details in these in these works that we see in a larger sense. Mm -hmm. But your work, at least again, this is just Joe's interpretation, whatever it's worth, really brings out that tangibility to it. All right, next one, please. And oh shoot, we're on slide eleven, and uh, we're going to have to kick it in the, kick it in the pants when we end up skipping. All right, let's go ahead and uh, discuss this one, please. This one is nice because it has these nice sort of controlled, for lack of a better way of putting it, horizontal lines that move from the left to the right. So once it reaches that spot, it's almost as though they it kind of goes free form in a way. Yeah. So this piece is titled Continuity, and it's the first piece that I did where I mimicked quill work and paint. Um, and it's meant to represent to be an abstract representation of cultural continuity and the reality so that you know the 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 organized section on the left is a direct reference to uh lakota quill work historic motifs of lakota quill work that you could find on you know on a buffalo robe or on a possible bag or um you know you could search through the collections and find this motif but then as it travels across and it goes through this plane it can either be seen as becoming undone and disheveled or it can be seen as becoming like dancing and becoming more free and it's supposed to be all of those things because culture isn't stagnant um, it's always going to represent a current time and place it's always going to represent um, the environment that it's in and it, it may still be strongly rooted to its original roots, to um, ancestral ties, but it may look different through time. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, let's move. Let's move along here. Um, if you don't mind, Diana, we're going to look at a few Lakota items um, from our collection. Maybe I don't mind at all. Yeah. <laughs> when you come out and visit, <laughs> then we can then we can really hit it hard. Um, so this is a Lakota pipe bag. Right, mm -hmm. and you can certainly see the the beadwork that's sort of in rows, um, which I call lane stitching. People call it other things. Um, um, let's have the next slide, please. This is a fabulous, fabulous pair of moccasins. Yeah. All right, go ahead. I, I know these are these are making your heart go pitter patter. So they are. They're you, so yeah, beautiful. Yeah, they are. They're, they're, <laughs> they're over the top. These are fantastic. I love them so much. Um, one thing I guess I want to express to people is, you know, these are old. So when we look at a lot of the work that are in collections, you know, these colors have faded. Like these were big, bright, you know, they still are bright, but those blues would have been even brighter, even richer, you know, and, and you know, all of the quill work would have been uh, super shiny, brand new. These are fabulous. So the amount of work that went into creating the top of those, it's a lot of quill work. I mean, it's yeah. just a foot, but that's a lot of quill work and it's it's clean and it's beautiful and it's got um, some really kind of core Lakota aesthetics and design principles in that, that, that really speak to, uh, again, you know, our worldviews and teaching. So that, that four directions cross is in there and then it's in there again in the center of the design and that mm. checkerboarding that's happening across. Mm -hmm. which is beautiful um and then the 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 beadwork along the edge that protects the quill work you know so if mm -hmm. you're walking around in those you've got a little bit of a layer of protection between you know the ground and and your quill work um yeah they just and then the satin edging along the yeah. you know the the tongue and the edges it's just 
and the the even the tie is tucked in there. See, that's not always that way either. Those are yeah. a well loved pair of moccasins. And and for me, when I see this stuff, you know, I just want to hug it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just so rich. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's just yeah. so you want to. Mm. So a lot of love goes into these creations. I mean, you know, you got to, I think it's important for folks to also remember that, you know, when these, when you're looking at works and collections, they're made for family members, you know, like that's somebody putting the love into, you know, the mocks that they made for their, their loved one, their child, their partner, whoever it may be, their cousin, their auntie, their grandma, you know, whoever. And it's, so there's, there's so much intention, you know, that goes into these works and you can still feel it. Yeah. And also, I, th I think what people don't necessarily realize, and I'll be honest, I, sometimes I get so um, focused on just the object, I guess one would say, is you have to think about the context that it's made in. Mm -hmm. And that context, like, for example, for you, I've been to your studio, you know, you have lighting and you got music going in the background, you know, that kind of thing. And for me, and, you know, every, I haven't done anything in a while, but you know, I kind of like to dabble a little bit. Maybe I'll make some earrings or whatever the case may be, you know, and I'll sit at my yep. little desk here with my little spotlight and my cheater glasses and all my little tools. <laughs> but when these were made, let's say 1880, 1870, they didn't have that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a nice little spotlight and, you know, cheater bifocal glasses or anything. And it's just, considering these, the quality of the work that they made it's just unbelievable the other thing that always blows me away is when you see pictures of of like there's just a handful of pictures of women working yeah and you know they're all sitting on the ground yeah bent over their work and like i have to have all this like ergonomic stuff to, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, to and, save and my the, back these days and i look yeah. at those pictures i'm like man these women are hardcore hardcore so, our people were stronger back then too, though. Think about how much physical work you had to do to live at that time that we yeah. don't have to do now. We are a softer people, like humanity. We are softer now than, yeah. than we were then, you know. And I guess a good, a, a good reference to that is the temperature that you're in right now, right? <laughs> These guys would have been outdoors in their, in their, right? Or their fire all, anyway, all right. So yeah. I got to, I got to really watch the time because this all is- All right, let's go. We, all right, next slide, please. All right, classic Lakota women's dress and all beadwork. And I wanted to show this one in reference to the work we saw earlier, that as we look at this, we see sort of like this whole composition. But as if we could, and we can't today, but as we get, if we could look at sort of little details that really help sort of bring the, bring the, the work even more further alive. Hey, hey. <laughs> all right, next slide, please. This is a, um, it's kind of been, I don't necessarily care for how this is photographed. It looked like it was run over by one of those steam trucks, but this is a, um, a baby uh, a carrier, cradle board. Yep. board. And we can certainly see some of these horizontal lines and these triangles that is classic in, is found in classic Lakota uh, work, but also certainly found in your work. Mm -hmm. And and oh god, this this time part is killing me. And if no, we look in the lower, if, if we look at the lower oh. left, we can see that little flap. If you look at the bottom of the flap, it's painted, so that's recycled par flesh. Yep. Which yep. is great. Yeah, and I, I, I'll make one quick plug: painting. The way that abstract painting is taught in this country mm -hmm. excludes the history of painting that was being done here pre-contact and that was being done by women <laughs> yeah um you know we're, we're taught the history of painting from uh, the lineage of of easel painting which is a really important contribution to the history of painting but painting is a human uh action and something that has history in communities all over the world and it is not exclusive to the history of, of easel painting on canvas hmm. all right so not only are you a painter, mm -hmm. not only are you a quiller and bead worker, but also you make earrings. Yeah, because I'm obsessed with them. 
<laughs> um, I love earrings and I used to paint a lot of earrings. So I used to do a lot of parfleche earrings, painting on rawhide. Um, it, it was, you know, before I was doing a lot of really large canvases, that was something I loved to do. And I have a huge earring collection. And then as I, as my, my studio practice got busier and busier and, and um, my, I had to become more and more intentional about my time and how I spent it. Um, and it made me sad because I didn't have time to make earrings anymore. I used to feed mm. them as well. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't justify, you know, 10 hours on a pair of beading, uh, on a pair of earrings. When if I spend 10 hours on a, a painting, I make a lot more money and I'm, I'm the breadwinner for my household. So I have yep, to think yep. about those things. Right. So this earring line is allows me to create, um, continue to create earrings. And it's really important for me because it's a point of accessibility. Um, not everybody can afford to buy a piece of my artwork. I can't afford my own work. So to be able to create something that people can access and buy is really important. Um, I, I think that, you know, art can be exclusive and it, it shouldn't always be that way. Yeah. All right, next slide, please. And then we're gonna look at two more and go from there. I think this one's critically important because this is another aspect of not only what is happening in all over Indian country these days, um, but also in a sense of, of, of identity. Um, well, go ahead. If you could explain this series, I would appreciate it. This is a this piece is titled "I Am Your Relative" and it's a, it's a photo installation. Um, so you get this here. Maybe we can go to the next slide so folks can see it. Uh, and it's okay. So these are double sided photographs. So the 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 front side um, you'll see here, and then when you walk around to the back side of the um, standing pieces, you see the the backs of the T-shirts that you saw on the previous slide. Um, this piece, I was invited to speak at a conference that uh, is for an organization called uh, Global Rights for Women here in uh, the Twin Cities, and they do uh, work globally to um, protect women and help pass legislation that protects women and, and put in policies across the globe um, for the protection of women. And so I went and I had to speak on um, violence against Native women, the missing and murder indigenous women and you know the epidemic of violence that our communities face. And uh, this installation piece came out of response from a um, performance piece that we did that night. I had seven minutes to talk about that topic. Oh and gosh. the topic is, is huge, you know, and yeah. it's so much, it's so related to the history of our country that I, you know, I was like, how the heck am I going to drive this home in seven minutes? And so I thought, well, I got to get their attention because this was at a fundraising gala, right? People are like eating and they're all dressed up and visiting and having fun. And so, um, so I asked my friends and my relatives to do this with me. And uh, before we took this stage, we all lilied really loud. <laughs> and everybody shut up. It was so cool. <laughs> they all, they didn't expect it, right? So we're all, yeah. and then everybody's just like, and we scared some people and they all just hushed. And then mm. what we did is um, I asked my daughter is the one on the far left here in the t-shirt that says I am. And so she went and she took the stage first and I asked each person to go up and hold the stage for five seconds and pause for that amount of time before the next person joined them. So it successively says, I am more than your desire, more than your fantasy, more than a mascot, ancestral love, prayer, sacrifice, your relative. And I spoke about the fact that um, one, I talked about the Lakota understanding of um, Itakiwayasi, which is the uh, understanding that we are all related. And when I say we, I mean all of life. All human beings are related to one another. The health and well being of one person is connected to the health and well being of another person. And um, likewise, the health and well being of, of humanity is connected to the health and well being of uh, plant, animal, and all of life. And that, um, 
imbalance creates, uh, you know, unhealthy situations. And so um, when, if you think about the ways that like a uh, pack animals travel, if there is an, uh, a, a family member within that pack that is not being cared for, that is not being paid attention to at the moment, mm -hmm. that's the family member that becomes um, perfect opportunity for predator. Right. And that is, I feel the, what is happening in a lot of ways to our communities. People don't know hardly anything about native people and native communities in our history. And we are excluded from mainstream uh, media and um, mainstream platforms. We're excluded from conversations on diversity. We're just, you know, we have been intentionally uh, erased. And when that happens, our folks are uh, in a position that is puts our people in very precarious positions and predators know this yeah and they utilize it and so this this piece is meant to uh, force people to remember we are your relatives and uh, we deserve to be treated as such next slide please lastly but not le not leastly by any means <laughs> Um, we are so, so fortunate at the Autry to, to recently acquire this wonderful, wonderful set of prints. Um, and I just, I just love these. Thank I just you. love these. For those of you who are not familiar with this, and you know, our clock is, we're, we're in overtime now, Diani. Just I know. Um, these are details of dresses. And just, uh, and if you think about the work we saw earlier at the top, we can see the little lines, which are, um, which represent dentillium shells. Some of them on the lower half, we, we have shells. The green one has abstracted dragonflies. The yellow one has that, that cross design, which we discussed earlier, as well as the blue one. Oh, 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 oh. Anyway, so if, and I know, I know this is impossible for you to do, but I'm gonna ask anyway. If you can just give us a very brief overview of these. Um, the, the suite of the four prints is titled Takes Care of Them. Um, and then they all have individual titles as well. Um, because we're doing it quick, they are in English, uh, lead, create, uh, protect, and nurture. They have uh, Lakota titles as well that correspond with the English titles, but are not one-to-one -one translations. They're conceptually related. And the this, this sweet honors um, the kinship relationships within Lakota communities and the way that our women collectively care for our communities. Mm. And so these pieces, like they, to me, they speak to different generations, different family members, different personalities and collectively those people come together and create, they lead, they create, they protect and they nurture our communities. So the blue one is like the unchi, that's the grandma. It's the oldest style of, of these dresses. The gold one is the create, it's the most blingy. It's like the young auntie. Yeah, yeah. Um, the green is the protect, which is why the dragonflies are there. Uh, and that one's like, I think about that one as the older, more mature auntie. And then the red one is, is nurture. And I think about that one as the mother um, because it speaks most closely to my mother and um, her dress and what she danced in. And um, yeah, so that's the quick synopsis. And, and, and just, and again, it, it's weird to see these in this context in the sense of understanding scale, but how big are these? Um, they are big enough that when you stand in front of it, you could like feel that it's the size of a dress that you could step into. Uh, okay. I don't have this, the, I don't have the paper size memorized, right. but so they're meant five they're, feet tall. Yeah. They're meant to, you know, they're big and they're yeah. meant to, you know, feel like you can, when you stand in front of it, it's, it's body size. Yeah. And there is many of your works, but particularly these ones. To me, and I've seen them in person, um, I've seen them installed in person. When you stand in front of them, there is a, and I don't even know how to describe this. Sorry, I live in a, in a loud part of town. Um, there is a certain feeling of power 
but also a same time, a feeling of comfort, mm. which are, it's just wonderful. Okay, Rob, let's take Thank down you. the slides, please. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody, it's us again. Um, so what we're gonna do, Gianni, if you don't mind, we have about eight minutes left. We got okay. some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is, um, thank you very much. She's so amazing. Um, <laughs> another one from an anonymous thank attendee. Well, what, a, what an interesting name. It's, the question is, what advice would you give to a young native artist who wants to explore new ways and incorporate traditions? Follow your heart. Hmm. Also follow your values and your teachings. Um, push through the scary parts, but also always circle back and speak to people within your community that you trust. Um, if you have a question, if you feel like you're doing something that doesn't feel right, <clears throat> talk to your relatives, talk to elders, talk to people that you trust. Um, yeah, those are, those are some key points to keep it succinct. Um, another question is, do you see these uh, more so these days, some shift of men doing beadwork and oh, art yeah. um, and like women did in the past or not really? Totally. I mean, there are phenomenal uh, male bead workers and quill workers and, um, you know, it's, it comes hand in hand with the fact that we've had shifts in our roles. You know, mm -hmm. there's reasons why women were the bead workers and quill workers. You know, we, we had <clears throat> roles in our communities that um, supported the family unit. You know, you did this and I do this and collaboratively we create and support this thing. And um, so with the disruption of that, it's quite natural that now there are men that do um, beadwork and quill work as well. And um, they do, I know some phenomenal male bead workers and quill workers. Um, and the dress that we saw from the collection earlier, as well as the reference to the prints, the four prints mm -hmm. that we bought of yours, are those ceremonial type of objects? Or are those everyday dresses? That's a good question. I guess it depends if we're talking, when we're talking. I mean, mm -hmm. right now, you know, they're at, every day in the fact that if you're going to go to a powwow, that's, you know, powwow isn't ceremony, but there's prayer that goes into that. You know, I, I think it's in how you define those terms. Yeah. Um, but they're everyday wear in a lot of cases um, or special occasion wear. I mean, I think that there was, you know, dresses that weren't as adorned historically when people were wearing these dresses every day, there were dresses that weren't as adorned. Um, but yeah, what do you, what's your answer to your own question, Joe? I'd like you're, you're flipping it on me now. Um, I well, I, I, I think, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so I think the tricky part about, about it is a Western mind of thinking separates Every day is on one side and ceremony on the other side. Exactly. Where yeah. it has been my experience, both professionally and personally, that with native views, there is no separation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you could be joking around in a ceremony. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a social powwow, somebody drops, somebody's eagle feather falls on the ground. Exactly. Everybody stops, bust out the veterans. Yeah, because they have to perform a ceremony. So and there's prayer. Yeah, exactly. So it's it it we, we one can't necessarily separate the two because it incorporates both of them. So yeah. for these dresses, you know, back in the day, there are probably, as one would say, every day. Whereas today, a powwow, whatever the case may be, for special moments when people are when native folks are are visually exercising their culture, they put on their finest gear, mm -hmm. which tends to be traditional style outfits. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's good. You, you go along with that? Huh? You go along with that? Yep. Okay. Totally, I concur. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to quickly answer some of the other ones that I see. Oh, good. I didn't know you can see them. Okay. Yep. Does your I am peace travel? Yes. Um, I have a show that's opening at the Kemper Museum on the 18th next week. Um, and it will be there. Uh, that's a, it's a 10 year retrospective exhibition. So they're going to have a lot of work. Um, and they're going to have a lot of online programming. So even if you can't make it to Kansas City, Missouri, um, you can, and they have a catalog, you'll be able to purchase the catalog online too, if you're interested. Uh, what contemporary artists inspire you right now, man, that's a long conversation. So many, I wish I could dig into that, but I don't think we have the time. Um, <clears throat> anybody who's pushing back against the system and making people grow and think towards what a healthier future can be for all of humanity, that's who I dig. Um, <laughs> prints or paintings. Uh, those prints are um, fine art prints, meaning that they are screen prints made at a at High Point Center for Printmaking by master printmakers. So they are an addition, right? So there's multiples, but it's not a print out of like a printer or out of a machine. Right. They're hand printed, hand processed. They have like uh, one of them, I think, has over 40 layers, you know, so each piece of paper has to go through the process, uh, you know, 40 times to get to the end product. So, um, by, you know, uh, that kind of printmaking is a, di a different kind of print. And that's where the we earrings. acquired our set. Yeah. Yeah. The earrings I'm wearing are my own creation. So it's part of the, you know, what Joe said. It, and you can purchase those. I have a website that's uh, Chetan Ska, which is just Lakota for White Hawk. Um, there's a button for it if you can't remember that at the bottom of my artist website. So my artist website is just dianiwhitehawk.com. And if you scroll down on the homepage, you'll see a button to the Chitanska website. Um, also, thanks. <laughs> That's so, all the questions. <clears throat> Your family's doing okay? Yes. Yeah, everybody's. Um, uh, in the house, everybody's okay. We have had losses in our extended family. Um, my sister-in-law has been sick. She's one of the long haulers. She's been sick since October. Honey, mm. she could use your prayers. So yeah. anybody, um, yeah, mask up, stay, stay out. You know, we've, we've lost a lot of people in the Indian community. So if there's anybody out there who is feeling like, oh, it's no big deal. It really is. Yeah. Um, a lot of culture bearers, a lot of language speakers, um, a lot of our elders have, have been hit really hard by this thing. But in our house, we're doing all right. Good, good. Staying home. <laughs> good. Well, um, thank you, Diani, for joining us today for our Autry Artist Salons. And again, thank you. thank you to everybody for taking the time to hear more about Diani. Uh, anyway, oh, jo join us for our next one, and you'll find out more information at theautry.org backslash masters. Thank you, Diani. And please, Thanks. and please, my best and blessings to your family. And I, and I hope your daughter, Nina, is doing well at college. She's great. I just love her. She is. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And thank you to everybody at the Autry. Thank you for your support. I'm honored you guys have a set of the prints. I'm glad that they live there with you all. And um, I just I appreciate you all. appreciate you, my friend. Well, we look forward to you visiting us in, in LA. Maybe we'll have to do something. Once the, once the pandemic passes, we'll have to get together and maybe get some of this group that is listening to us now and have a little artist talk in the gallery or look at the collection. We'll figure it out because Whenever you and I are together, we always end up having fun. Yes, most definitely. All, All right. right. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.